Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to my video channel. Thank you so much for joining me for another video in our Rust programming tutorial series. In the last video in the Rust programming playlist that I've put together on my YouTube channel, we covered the process of reading CSV or comma separated value files using a special CSV package. We're going to kind of build on top of that theme of parsing data by exploring the ability to use regular expressions inside of Rust programs. Now, if the concept of regular expressions is something that's new to you, then you'll want to probably go through some pure regular expression tutorial series so that you better understand the syntax of regular expressions. We're going to take a look at some simple examples of regular expressions, but to truly deep dive into the different syntaxes that you can use to express different patterns within a regular expression string, then you'll probably want to just dedicate some time to learning about the regex syntax. It's a really cool language. It's extremely powerful. And once you know how to parse using regular expressions, it'll open up a lot more opportunities for you to build helpful utilities in the Rust language and many other languages that support regular expressions as well. So that regex knowledge can kind of translate to many other languages. It's not just Rust specific. So we're going to be taking a look at this crate here called regex. Now, Rust, the standard library, does not include support for regular expressions. If you want to do regex parsing, you'd either have to write it yourself, which is presumably a lot of work, or you could just use this off the shelf regex package here, which is available on the crates.io registry. Now, this is a pretty straightforward package to use, very similar to the CSV package that we looked at in the previous video. It is a pretty straightforward set of data types here that we can work with. Specifically, there is a regex struct here that's exported from the regex crate. And this is what we're going to use to create a pattern and then perform captures against an input string. Now, the terminology that's used in the regex crate here for the input string is actually something called the haystack. So the haystack is basically the text that you want to perform a match against using a pattern that you've built your regex object with. So it's pretty straightforward. All we need to do all is call this new function here. When we call the new function on the regex type, it basically just takes in a static string value here. And that's going to be the regex pattern that you want to use to detect certain patterns within a given set of input text. Once you've constructed that regex, you can go ahead and reuse that pattern. You can even declare the pattern as a separate string. So if you want to construct multiple regular expression objects using different patterns or maybe join those patterns together, whatever it is you want to do, uh, you can basically just declare that as a separate string value and then pass in the uh, pattern as a variable rather than hard coding it into the new function call here. Now, when you call the new function, it's going to return a result where you might potentially get an error if maybe you specified a bad pattern or something like that. So you will want to make sure that the result is OK. So there's an is underscore OK function that we can use on the result type to make sure that we don't actually have an error and that we do have a regex returned back to us. So once you unwrap that resulting regex object there, then we can use some helpful functions or methods right over here in order to detect patterns. One of the most simple examples is to just detect if there is or isn't a match. So this would be something like if you wanted to validate an email address, you could say, just tell me true or false, does this input text match an email address. And if it doesn't, then you can, you know, reject that email address input and ask the user to re-input a proper email address. Or if is match returns true as a Boolean value, then you can go ahead and take that input and do something further with it, like write it into a database somewhere for a mailing list application. So that's a really simple example where you just basically are detecting if there is or isn't a match. 
However, if you want to extract data out of a string, let's say that maybe you have something like a CSV file format, right? And you need to come up with some kind of custom parser, or maybe you're parsing log files and you're looking for year, month, day, and then hour, minute, second, and then maybe a warning level, like info, warning, error, something like that, and then some random message following that error level. Well, in that type of case, you're going to need to actually extract, you know, what is the error level? Is it info? Is it warning? Is it error? Is it debug? You know, what exactly is the message level? What is the actual message that's being passed into the log? And then what are those individual field values for the year, month, day, and then hour, minute, and second? That's where we want to actually perform data extraction and go line by line through a log file and and pick out all of those individual fields using a regular expression. So those are just a couple of examples where you might want to use regex, but in the case of a simple email match, you might just detect if it's true or false as a match. But in the case of you know parsing a log file where we actually want to extract the values of those individual fields, we can actually use this function here called captures, and this will return just the first match. If you have an array of matches, so if you have, let's say, a multi-line log file where you have one log entry on each line of the log file, then you can also use this function right here called captures underscore iter, and this will return an iterator over an array of matches that you can use to detect a series of multiple matches within a given log. Now, if you do need to do something like parsing a log file or parsing a CSV file that typically uses a new line character as the row separator character, then you're also going to need to set up multi-line mode in your capture. So to do that, there is a, another type here called regex builder. So if you watched my CSV video that came just before this that I recorded yesterday, then you know that we had the CSV reader and the CSV builder that allows us to kind of customize the reading abilities or options that we have on the actual CSV reader. Well, we have a very similar pattern here where we have just kind of a core regex type with some kind of sane default options, but then there's a separate object here called the regex builder. And if we create a new instance with this, we once again pass in the pattern here. But then before we actually build the regex object itself that we just looked at before, we can actually specify some custom options here. There's a multi-line method here that allows us to set the multi-line option to enabled right here. You can also specify inline options with regular expression patterns too. So there's kind of a separate syntax that you can use directly inside of the regex pattern at the very beginning that lets you enable multi-line mode. But if you prefer to do it from your Rust code, you can just call this function on the builder and then that'll return the updated builder back to you and then finally once you've specified any configuration options that you want here you can go ahead and just call the build function right here and once again that'll return a result that's wrapping your final regex object and then you can use that regex object to call things like captures or captures iter or find or is match and so on and so forth. Now, another more advanced use case for regular expressions is to do a search and replace. So if you want to search for a certain pattern, like any word that starts with T, I want to replace the first character T with an S instead. So if I wanted to do that, I could write a regular expression pattern, and then I could use a function like the replace here in order to specify a replacer that takes a certain input and then replaces it with a different value. So that's another nice option about using regex is that you can look for very advanced patterns and then you can perform replacements on those patterns. And this helps you to manipulate very large data files efficiently. So what we're going to do is jump into some code samples where we install this crate and then we're going to take a look at how to create one of these regex objects and call some of these helper functions in order to detect patterns inside of input strings. 
Now, before we get to the actual code sample, I wanted to invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Since I'm an independent content creator, any kind of support that you can lend to this channel is extremely helpful. So if you subscribe, if you like the video that you're watching right now, if you go through the playlist and watch the other Rust tutorial videos that we have in this Rust programming playlist, that would be great as well. There's probably a lot of different topics in here that will help you, especially if you're new to programming in general, or maybe just new to the Rust language specifically. We cover a lot of advanced topics in here, like parsing JSON data, parsing CSV data, threading inside of Rust, and a whole bunch more. Also, I have a link in the pinned comment down below to my Amazon storefront, and anything that you purchase directly through that storefront will go to helping support this channel as well so that I can bring you more videos like this one. All right, so what we're going to do is jump over into our editor here. So I'm going to be using VS Code connected to my remote Linux virtual machine on one of my LXD servers that's running in a different room. And what we're going to do is go ahead and just spin up a new project here. So I'm going to do a make dir, and then we'll just call it regex-test for now. And then I'll do Control-K, Control-O, and just open up that directory in my editor here. Now, once we've got this project folder open, we need to just do a typical cargo init. That's how we create a new project and kind of scaffold things out so that we can spin up our application here. And then as soon as we do that, we'll have a series of files in here, one of those being cargo.toml. So if we just cat cargo.toml, you'll see by default, we don't have any additional third-party dependencies installed, but if we head over to crates.io, this is the package registry where community members can upload their dependencies or libraries that other people can consume in their applications. If we just do a search for regex, you'll see that we've got this regex crate right here. Uh, it's very popular. It's got over 172 million installs, so that's pretty popular and it's got a whole bunch of version history and if you take a look at the dependence tab right here this will actually show you a list of some of the most popular packages that actually consume the regex package so you might actually kind of look through this list and see if there's any additional crates that you might be able to use that also work with regex in any case let's go ahead and add this to our project so we'll just do a cargo add regex here and there are some optional features available in this crate so as you may know crates support optional features that that you can enable during the installation of that crate but we're not going to be using any of those right now because all the core functionality is available with the default feature set so let's go ahead and just do a cargo add regex down here That'll pull in our default feature set here, as you can see in this list. There are a few that are disabled by default here, but again, that doesn't really matter too much because we'll be able to use the core functionality. So now if we head over to the main.rs file here, that's our entry point into our application, and I'll go into Zen mode here to provide a little more screen real estate. So let's go ahead and just get rid of this hello world line, and we'll build out a function called test regex and we'll call that from our main function. That'll just help keep our main function clean so that if we want to come up with any more test scenarios, we can just kind of segment those off into separate functions and then just call those functions from our main function. All right, so inside of this test regex function here, the first thing that we want to do is go into the regex crate here, do double colon, and we can instantiate this regex type here. Now, if you don't want to type out the full path to that, you can also just go to the top and say use regex regex. You can also put these use statements inside of your function, so it'd be perfectly valid syntax to put that inside of my function. But since there may be other functions that I define inside of this main.rs source file, I want to make sure that I declare it at the root of the crate here so that I can declare those additional functions and still be able to use this imported type. So now what we'll do is just do a regex with a capital R that refers to the regex struct that we imported. And then we'll just use the new function here to instantiate this type. Now the RE parameter here for the new function is going to take a input of a static string. So we'll just say let my pattern equal something as a double quoted string here. And then we'll go ahead and do something like A to Z 
And let's say that we're just going to search for a first name. So like Trevor or Nancy or Joe or Sean or something like that, right? So any of those names would range from maybe three characters to, let's say, eight characters. So what I'm going to do here is specify something known as a regular expression character class. This is surrounded in square brackets, and I can do a kind of a range of characters here, like lowercase a to lowercase z. I can also do uppercase a to uppercase z. I can also do ranges like 0 through 9 if I'm trying to detect digits. For example, if I was parsing a file and looking for a year or a month or a day, then I might want to specify 0 through 9 and then a quantifier of four, and that would help me to find a, a year, like 1972 or 1993. Those are four-digit years that all use digits zero through nine, right? So this is a simple pattern to detect a year. Uh, maybe I could detect a literal dash as well, and sometimes you might have to escape these, so you might have to put in a backslash here in order to escape that character because it has special meaning within the context of a regular expression pattern. And then after that, we could say, you know, 0 through 9 again and have a quantifier of 2. So now we're looking for a four-digit year and then a literal dash and then a two-digit month. And then I could just do the same thing again and look for a two-digit day following that. So that's an example of how you might detect a date pattern in a log file. But in this case, we're just going to be searching for a first name. So I'm going to do A to Z lowercase and A to Z capital characters here. Or even to be a little bit more advanced, we could say A to Z capital and then specify that we want a quantifier of one. And then we could say lowercase a to z, and we could have anywhere from two extra lowercase characters all the way up to maybe eight extra characters. So basically, this is a pattern here that's always going to look for a starting character that's a capital letter, and then any number from two to eight characters following that that are lowercase. And so that's kind of a good indicator of a first or last name, or, or middle name for that matter. So now we can pass in my pattern as a variable into regex here. And the reason we're getting this error is because we don't have a semicolon at the end here. And our function here doesn't have a return type. So it's considered the unit type in Rust. And if you don't have a semicolon at the last expression in your function, then it's going to try to return that value. So it's essentially the same thing as doing a, an explicit return here. And so we want to make sure that we put a semicolon at the end here, and that will suppress Rust from returning this expression back to the caller of this test regex function. So now you can see that we get this result returned from this new function. So we want to capture that so we can actually use the regex object. So I'll say let my regex or maybe call it name regex just to be a little bit more explicit there and then this is going to return this result that wraps our regex and potentially an error if there's any errors in our pattern here during instantiation so now that we have this object we need to first check to see if it's okay so we'll say if name regex dot is error then we'll go ahead and maybe just do a panic here so we can use the panic macro to just panic and say, you know, error in regex pattern. But if it's not an error, then we want to do something, some kind of detection or data extraction with this regex. So let's start by just taking a look at the simple function over here on the regex type. So let's go down to structs and then regex. And we have that really simple is match function here. And that's just going to return a bool on a given input haystack string, right? So the input text that we're detecting is called the haystack. So anytime that you see haystack in reference to the regex crate, that's what it's referring to. So let's define another variable up here called input text. And we'll just set that to something like Trevor for now. And then we can just change that later on to some other values so that we can test out some others. So then what we're going to do is to use the regex object. So we'll say name regex dot unwrap. And that'll give us the actual regex object. And it unwra unwraps it from this result object here. And then once we have that, we can go ahead and call the is match. And then we can pass in the haystack value, which is going to be our input text variable. 
So let's pass that in. And the result from is match is just going to be a Boolean value. Either it does or it doesn't match, right? So let's say let match result equal that, and that'll be a Boolean type. And then we'll just say print line did input match pattern. And then we'll just print out the value of match result inside of that print line statement. So let's go ahead and give this function a try here. So we're basically just declaring this pattern. We're instantiating the regex with that pattern that we've declared. And then we check to see if there's an error in here. And if there is, then we'll just panic our application. Or you could just do something a little bit more polite, like you know, print a print an error message with print line and say error in regex pattern. And then we can just return the function early so that any of the code down here doesn't actually execute if an error is detected. But it's kind of up to you what approach you want to take. So we'll go ahead and just leave the panic in place and then we'll do a cargo run. So a few dependencies are going to get compiled in here. Finally, our application. And as you can see, it is returning true because our regex pattern did match our input text. So we have a capital single capital letter here, followed by two to eight, kind of a range uh, definition here of lowercase characters. So what if we changed the input text to be something like TR? So we'll keep the same pattern that we've already declared, but we're just going to put in a single capital letter and a single lowercase letter. Do you think we're going to get a true or a false in our match? Well, if you said false, you would be correct because the T and the R the T matches just fine. It matches this expression right here. It's a capital letter, a single capital letter to be specific. But then following that single capital letter, we only have a single lowercase letter. And we indicated as a quantifier to our regular expression that we wanted to have a minimum of two lowercase letters directly following the uppercase letter. So in this particular case, this two character word here is not going to match our input pattern. However, if I did TRE, then because the RE matches a minimum of two lowercase letters, you can see that that will match just fine. Now we could go back and change it to TR. And then if we change the quantifier and say, I want a minimum of one lowercase letter, then you should be able to see that that does match as well. So now we can plug in pretty much any first name that we want to, like Daniel, for example, and that should match. Yep, it did. And we could do something like Joe, and we get true once again, that does match. We could do Sally, do that, and it matches. Sure enough, we could try Nancy and see if that matches as well. So all of those different first names are going to match just fine, right? Now, what if we want to get the actual name that was passed in, right? So one of the things we could do is pass an input string that's a little bit more complex, like Nancy is going to the store. And so now what we're going to do here is detect the very first word, but we're going to omit the, anything that follows that first word, because what's implied here when we do a regex match is that we're starting at the very beginning of the string. So you have to think about there kind of being a cursor that has internal state in a regex. And so the regex engine is going to start at the left hand side of the string. And it's going to progress one by one through the characters in the input string. And it's going to attempt to match them to the regular expression pattern that you've specified in your input pattern string. And so what's going to happen here is it's going to look for this first identifier here. It's going to say, OK, do I see a capital letter? Yes, I do. And then following that, it's going to look at the A here and say, does that fall into this pattern here where we have lowercase a to z and a quantifier of 1 to 8. Well, yes, it does. Does the n match that pattern as well? We're still looking for up to 8. Yes, it does. Does c match that pattern? Yes, it does. Does y match that pattern? Yes, it does. But when we get to this space here, the regex engine tries to do a comparison against this pattern here, and it says, hey, a space doesn't fall into this a to z character class because a to z only contains the individual characters from A to Z. It doesn't include any special characters like asterisks or backslashes or forward slashes or dashes or anything like that. 
and the white space characters like a space or a tab character are also going to be excluded from this character range. So as soon as the regex engine identifies a mismatched character in this input string, it's going to see that that's the end of our pattern, so it's not going to try to match any more characters in the remainder of the string. So what this allows us to do is to define a input string, and it doesn't really matter what name we put for the first word here, that's always going to be the name that's returned by the regex engine. So now, of course, we already know that this, go this is going to match, right? So if we do a cargo run, it's still going to match because this pattern matches. But what if we had different sentences like Nancy is going to the store or Joseph is going to the store, right? Those are completely different names. But if we had a text file that had a whole bunch of lines with different first names and all we wanted to do was extract the first names from that file, then we would need some way to dynamically detect what that first name is from each line in the input text file, right? So we want our regular expression pattern to work regardless of what the input string is, as long as it matches this general pattern. So what we'll do is go down here and instead of just calling dot is match here, we actually want to get the result. We want to actually capture the value that was being returned back from the pattern match. And one of the ways that we can do that is to use this find function here. So what this is going to do is it's going to return the first match that it locates using that regular expression pattern. It's not going to find multiple matches. It'll only find the first match. So what we can do is change this call here to dot find. And once again, all we have to do is pass in the haystack as our input value. But the key difference between is match and find is that the find actually returns a match that's wrapped inside of an option. So the option allows us to check to see if there's none. So if there was no match, then we would just get the option none variant returned. Or if there is a match, then we'll get that match in the option and we can just call the unwrap function on it. And that'll allow us to retrieve the underlying value. So what we'll do is say dot find, then we'll pass in our input text variable here. And that should give us this option match here. So the other thing we could do here, if we didn't want to check to see if the option has none or some, what we could do is say unwrap or, and we could specify an or value and just say invalid. So like no value was detected, right? And because it's returning a match, we would actually have to construct a match object instead, but I'm not gonna do that in this particular case. So we're just gonna say dot unwrap here and Actually, there's a little bit better way to do that. So what we'll do is say if let uh, match sum match equal match result. Whoops, let's close off that parenthesis there. So then what we can do is use this syntax here in order to set a variable like my match, for example. You can't use keywords like the match keyword, which refers to a looping construct in, uh, not really a looping construct, but a control flow statement in Rust. So now this my match variable, if match result does have a value and it's not none, then this my match variable will get populated with the actual match object. And so inside the context of this if statement or this block, we can go ahead and use that my match variable. And if we check out the documentation for the match type in the regex crate here, let's go down to structs and then click on the match documentation here. You'll be able to see that we can get the underlying value that's returned from the match as a string by using the as string function right here. We can also see where it starts and ends. So we can see inside of the string which character position it actually starts at. So if it starts at, at zero at the first character, then the start should return zero. But if it detects that name somewhere further down in the string, then it would return where, wherever the starting character appears inside of the string starting at a zero index. You can also see a length, so basically how long was the name. At the moment, we have a regex pattern over here that has a variable size. The name could be as short as 
well, now three characters because we have a single capital and minimum of two lowercase here. But we could have one capital letter followed by eight lowercase letters, and that would result in a total length of nine. So in that case, we could have a range anywhere from three to all the way up to nine characters. And so we kind of need to know, well, what is the length of the final match, right? So the len function here on the match type is going to allow us to detect exactly how long that matched name is. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a shot. We'll go down here and say, uh, not did input match, but what is the actual match value? So we're going to put in a placeholder here and say who went to the store question mark and then we'll pass in my match dot as string and that will return our match as a string value that we can pass into this string template so let's give this a try we'll do a cargo run down here and as you can see it says who went to the store well the answer is nancy because our input string right up here says nancy is going to the store but using variable shadowing, we can overwrite that same variable and uncomment this line by saying Joseph is going to the store. And so now if we rerun our application, the latest value of input text is going to start with Joseph. So now you can see that Joseph was parsed from the regular expression. Or I could change it to something like Trevor, and that's also going to extract just fine. Um, if I say Joe Schmo is going to the store, then that's not going to match because I put a second capital letter and it wasn't expecting that. But if I put a lowercase s, that'll parse fine as well, as long as it's a maximum of nine characters, including the first capital letter, it should match just fine here. So that's how we can extract the match value from our regular expression. But things can get a little bit more advanced from there. Let's say that within a single match that you wanted to extract multiple values. So in regex terminology, we call these capture groups. You can do a single match, but within that particular match, you can have multiple groupings of data that you want to extract from the regex pattern. So let's consider an example here. Let's do a input string here. I'll just get rid of that duplicate line. And then I'm gonna change this input string to some kind of CSV-ish pattern, right? So I'm gonna say Trevor and then pipe character and then Sullivan pipe character. And we'll say, what year is it right now, right? In Trevor's life, what year is it right now? It's 2023. So this is gonna be our input data. And now we need to write a pattern from scratch that extracts the first name as a field or a capture group. We also need to grab the last name as a capture group as well. And then we'll have a third capture group that returns the year from this kind of CSV-ish data. So for starters, we want a pattern substantially similar to what we just had. So we'll say capital A to Z. We just want one character because our first name is always going to start with a capital letter, assuming that our data is clean and standardized. Then we're going to do a literal pipe character. So we'll just say pipe here. And the pipe has special meaning in the regex terminology. So it's actually an or. So it's match this pattern or the next pattern or the following pattern. And so what we want to do is escape that by using a slash here. I'm also going to turn this into a raw string so that I don't have to escape the actual slash. So if you just prefix your string in Rust with an R, that will indicate to Rust that this is a raw string. And we don't want the slash to be interpreted as a special character from Rust's perspective. But the slash is now going to get passed into the regex engine. And then the regex engine is going to ignore the special meaning behind the character that directly follows the slash. So instead of using the special or logic inside of this regex pattern, the regex engine is going to look at this pipe character as a literal pipe character, which we have in our input data. So following that pipe character, we want to look for the last name. So um, of course, I need to finish the first name here. So we'll do A to Z and we'll just do a quantifier of two to eight. So that should match just fine because we have five lowercase characters. So now we can do basically the same thing for the last name. So we'll just copy that and put it for last name. 
And then we want to detect the year. And the year we'll just assume is always going to be four digits. So what we'll do at the very end right here is do another literal pipe character by doing a slash pipe. And then we'll look for zero through nine and then do a quantifier of always exactly four characters. So it'll only match if there's four consecutive digit characters that are together at the very end here. So now we want to turn this into from just a pattern to an actual capture group. For starters, let's go ahead and just run this. I'm actually just going to get rid of this who went to the store prefix here. And so we'll just do a cargo run. And as you can see right down here on line 22, it is actually printing out the result. I'll just prefix it with result so that we can explicitly see that it's line 22 that's printing that out. And so it is actually matching, right? It is successfully matching. But what's happening here is that the entire match is getting printed out. So when you call find, it's just going to give you the entire match without breaking it down into subgroups. So how do we break things down into these child groups? Well, first of all, in the pattern itself, we have to declare what a group is. And to do that in the most minimal way, we can simply surround each of these matches with parentheses. So around the first name pattern that we have right here, we're going to put a set of parentheses around that, and that'll designate it as a capture group within the regex engine. The same thing, so after the pipe character, but right before we start the surname or last name, we'll go ahead and add another set of parentheses. And then same thing for the year. Right after the pipe character, we want to put an opening parenthesis. And again, at the very end, we want a closing parenthesis. So now we've declared that there's going to be three separate groups, all the way from this one to this one, and finally this one, which is the year. So now, instead of using the find function here, which just returns the aggregate match with regardless of the capture groups, now this is where we want to switch over to using the captures capability. So when we go into the regex type here and use captures, this is going to find the first match in the haystick haystack. And what it's going to do is it's going to match each capture group in the regular expression. So find doesn't care about groups, but captures does care about groups. Captures is going to return this captures object. And then inside of the captures object, we can use the get function right here in order to return a capture group at a specific index. Now, something that's important to note is that when you use this approach, when you break things down into capture groups, there is always going to be a capture group that's implied without you having to specify a capture group at position zero. So you'll always be able to read the capture at position zero if you do have a match. So the groups that we specified, one, two, and three, are going to be indexes one, two, and three. So one will be first name, two will be last name, and three will be the four digit year that we specified in this pipe delimited input data, right? So the zero with capture is always going to refer to the entire capture, kind of like what find did. But if we want those individual capture groups that we declared inside of our match expression, that's where we need to go to index one, two, and three. So what we're going to do is change the results here just a little bit. Instead of doing a find operation, we're going to say dot captures. And we're going to call captures on our input text variable. And so now we have an option of type captures, and we'll say if let sum uh, captures equals match result, then we want to do something with this captures variable. So we'll go ahead and do a print line, and we'll pass in a few different values. So I'll just do you know, value, comma, value, comma, value. And then for each of these placeholders with these curly braces right here, I'm going to pass in first name and then last name and then year, right? So we're going to parse those values out of the regex and then we're going to print each of those values independently because we captured them with these capture groups. So for starters, let's go into captures, this variable that's populated with our actual capture object. And then we'll say dot get and again, we want to get the capture group at position one because that's going to represent the first name field. 
Again, the zeroth match group is always going to be the entire capture. And so if we go into this match type here, we can once again call this as string function to turn the match into a string representation. So what we'll do is say dot unwrap dot as string. So every time that we get one of these matches, if we go back to the captures type here, go to the get function, every time that we call get on a capture group, it's it's going to give us an option which could either be none or some. And so if it is some, then we want to unwrap it and then call the as string function to get the underlying value of that group. So we'll pass in that one first. And I'm just going to split this print line statement across multiple lines here to make it a little bit more readable. We'll put a comma at the end, and then we'll do captures.get number two. So that's going to be last name dot unwrap dot as string. And then finally, we'll do captures.get three dot unwrap dot as string. So now we have one, two, three inputs for these three different sets of curly braces in our print line macro. Let's go ahead and do a cargo run here. And sure enough, you see we get Trevor space Sullivan space 2023 separated by commas because that's what we declared in our print line statement here. If we wanted to do something else inside of our print line statement with those individual values, it's going to simply follow this pattern that we've specified here, right? But this proves that we were able to extract the first name, the last name, and the year from that pipe delimited input. So even if I change these values to something else like Shannon Drew 2023, then if I do cargo run, now we get different values for first name, last name, and year, right? So this is a really powerful thing with a regular expression engine to be able to take a single match, but again, break it down into individual components so that I can use those individual values that I've extracted from the input string and repopulate them somewhere else, like maybe in a database in a certain uh, fashion, right? So regular regular expressions are extremely powerful. Uh, something else that you can do as well with groupings is to actually give the groupings a name. So if I wanted to literally name this first capture group first name, then I can use this little weird syntax here where I put a question mark right inside the first parenthesis. So in this capture group here, I go to the first parenthesis that opens it up, and then I do question mark less than greater than, and inside of that less than greater than bracket, we just plug in the name of the capture group that we want. So for this one, I'll do first name, and then for the next capture group here, I'll do question mark less than greater than, and then I'll plug in last name. And then for the last one here, I'll just do question mark less than greater than, and inside of that, I'll put year. All right, so let's change the year to maybe something else like 2011. And now we want to try to retrieve these capture groups by using their names instead of their indexes, right? So we could now kind of reorder things and put them into different positions. And we can always reference that specific capture group by its name rather than just in a random index number, right? So to do that, if we go back to the captures type right here, you can see that we have the get function, and this allows us to pass in the index, right? That's what we already used. But if we go over to this function here called name, this is going to return an option wrapping a match. Once again, it's the same exact return type as the get function here. But the difference with name is that we can return a match that's associated with a capture group that has a name, but we can't use this until we actually give our capture groups names because until we name them, they just have indexes. So if you want to use the more friendly approach, in my opinion, where you actually name your individual groups and then use the name function, this is going to be a lot more readable because now instead of doing dot, dot get one, I can say dot name and then specify first name. So now when I'm reading through my Rust code here, I can see that I'm specifically grabbing a group called first name somewhere in my regular expression. So if I ever need to go debug my regular expression, I know that this specific reference here is to the first name group. And then same thing down here, we'll change this to name and say last name. And then finally, we'll change this one from name from get to name, and then we'll do year instead. And everything else stays the same because the return type is the same as the get function. All we do is replace it with a name call. 
So now if we do cargo run, you can see that once again, those were extracted perfectly fine. And we can substitute other values in here like Joe Schmo 2002. And if we run this again, we extract those by their field names, so by their group names here, rather than just using a group index number. So this is a really nice way to write regular expressions. Again, I would encourage you to go a step further and actually learn about different regular expression syntaxes. I've just shown you some really basic regular expression patterns here, but there's a lot more advanced things that you can do as well. So hopefully you learned something new from this video. If you did, please leave a like and also just leave a comment below. Let me know what your thoughts on the video are. And again, please check out the pinned comment down below that has a link to my Amazon storefront that helps to support this channel. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.